Hey, 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 happy Monday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch, brought to you by, amazingly enough, thegaminggang.com, of which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. So welcome aboard. Tonight is Monday, May 2nd. 2022 this is live stream 781 this is your first time joining me let me point out this is super super casual just hanging out talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news and then taking a look at a tabletop game and tonight we are going to unbox and take a first look at crescent moon from Osprey Games. This is hitting stores later this month, and it sounds very, very interesting. So we are going to jump on into that in just a bit. Do want to point out, if you are tuning in to see the unboxing, we tackle the tabletop gaming news first, and then we get into our first looks at the various different games. So it'll be about 30 minutes or so before we jump on into the unboxing. So if you're watching live, just kick your feet up, relax, enjoy some discussion. If you, uh, if you have been a subscriber for a while to the channel, jump into chat. I will mention that in just a couple of moments. But chill out, relax, we will get to the unboxing. Now, if you're watching 30 minutes or more after this stream has ended, then there are timestamps, and you'll be able to actually jump ahead if you want to just skip past the news. Although we've got some pretty cool gaming news tonight. Sweet. So I also want to mention that if you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. We'll not only let you know when the Dispatch streams live, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central. We'll also let you know when I upload other videos, such as my first look video at the Pathfinder Gears... Oh, I'm sorry, this is the Guns deck. <laughs> and the Pathfinder Gears deck. So I did a first look video at both of these, so by all means, feel free to check that out. For some reason, I am going to sneeze. That came out of nowhere. It's a little dusty down here in the duct tape studios. And woo, it's just like I'm talking and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I feel it. It's, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Sneeze. All righty. Anyway, of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Lastly, this is a live stream. So that means there is chat available. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. Also, you must be a subscriber to the channel for at least 48 hours to take part in chat. Yet another way that I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. But if you want to say howdy, maybe you got a question, a comment, by all means, chime in and I will respond. Clint Gibson was first out the gate today in chat, followed by Kevin Smith. Testy Trekkie, JP Falconer Honor, 
who we haven't seen JPF in a while. Good to see you back. Sarah D's poking out, saying hi, and saying bless you. Thank you. Good tight. Now all of a sudden I'm a little sniffly. It's like, uh, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, sneeze. Why I order. All right, so welcome aboard, everybody. Let's jump on into the news because this summer is going to see the release of Ready, Set, Bet from AEG. Here's the scoop. In Ready, Set, Bet, you and your friends head to the races for a day of cheering, jeering, and betting on your favorite horses whose fates hang on every roll of the dice. Ready, Set, Bet is played over four rounds. Each round consists of a race followed by bet resolution. During each race, players freely place their bet tokens on the board while the race is going on. After each race, players win or lose money for each of their placed bet tokens and then receive a VIP club card to help them win more money in the following races. After four rounds, a player with the most money wins. Ready, set, bet is for two to nine players, ages 14 and up. Plays around 45 to 60 minutes. It's going to carry an MSRP of $39.99 when it arrives in August. So this does appear to be a Gen Con release for AEG. Now, strangely enough, if you recall last Gen Con, I interviewed Luke Peterschmidt from AEG, and this was a game that we were talking about that he had pointed out that he is not into like betting games or racing games or anything like that. And that he has had a blast with this game. And that's the reason why AEG was going to go ahead and publish this. So I got to say, looks kind of cool. I don't mind horse racing games. I remember win place and show, or was it win place or show? I think it's win place or show the old, bookcase game from Avalon Hill. I'm not saying it was all that exciting. I just remember it. <laughs> this could be kind of cool. I got to say, though, I get a feeling that there's there will be people, obviously, out there who will not pick this up because of the gambling aspect to it, even though you're really not gambling money, right? Or maybe you would be. I don't know. How serious do you take your board gaming? <laughs> All right, moving right along. Arriving this spring from LB Pavo is the second edition of Carnival Zombie. Here's the latest. After the acclaimed first edition, the long-awaited cooperative board game is finally back with tons of new content and massive replayability. Are you ready for the challenge? Carnival Zombie is a cooperative board game for 1-6 players following a group of characters who are fleeing on terra firma from a sinking city overrun by, you guessed it, zombies. Players control this party of heroes as they fight their way to one of the possible escape routes out of the city. During the night, they face restless hordes of zombies, while during the day they recover, move, or search for useful items and survivors. Use wisely the few daytime hours to prepare yourself for the night as you will face a flood of zombies when the sun sets. Combat is fast and deterministic and random chance will not jeopardize your decisions. But the horde is fierce and will always put you under through choices. I think, I think this is an Italian company and the localization of this piece did it again. Sneezed again. Damn. I was hoping, I was hoping I could maybe get to the, to the video I've got coming up so I can race off and go blow my nose real quick so I don't sneeze again. The pile of corpses dexterity minigame could make any slain undead rise again. So keep your cool in this ever-growing thrill. Yeah, once again, not great localization. The second edition includes new scenarios that will allow you to face totally new challenges. Some of the features 
that you will find in the scenarios are tutorials, shorter and harder games, trader mechanics, scalability with a variable number of characters, one character for each player, competitive games, more dexterity games, and night-only scenarios. Finales also can be played as standalone scenarios as well. Carnival Zombie 2nd Edition is for 1-6 to six players, ages 14 and up, plays in 45 to 120 minutes, and it's going to carry an MSRP of $85 when it arrives later this quarter. So I got to point out, as far as I understand, this was a Kickstarter that has taken forever to fulfill. Forever. So I understand a lot of people are very happy that it is finally arriving. And as you can see, it has received a Dice Tower seal of approval. Dice Tower had nothing to do with the Kickstarter fulfillment. But uh, miniatures look kind of cool. Art style looks unique. It's kind of an unusual sort of theme. I mean, yes, it's zombies, but you're trying to escape a city that's sinking. So there's that as well. So kind of interesting. And I believe it's got a lot of scenarios as well. All right. How about let's talk about some role-playing game news. Because last week in chat, Tessie Trekkie was talking about how they would love to mash up Murder, She Wrote and Call of Cthulhu. And of course, I had pointed out there is a role-playing game like that, and it just happens to have a new edition up for crowdfunding, and it is from the Gauntlet gaming community. And of course, I am talking about the Mythos Mystery role-playing game Brindlewood Bay. Here's the skinny. Brindlewood Bay is a groundbreaking murder mystery game for one keeper, your game master, and up to four players. It's powered by the apocalypse, but also uses the innovative carved from Brindlewood mystery system where even the keeper doesn't know the solution. The game is inspired by cozy mystery shows like Murder, She Wrote, but also takes inspiration from supernatural fiction and police procedural shows from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. In the game, you play a group of elderly women enjoying their retirement in the picturesque New England town of Brindlewood Bay. Their partners are deceased. Their children have long flown the nest, and now they find companionship in one another. An important part of the story is that cozy feeling. We get to see these women enjoying their lives, helping and supporting each other, and pursuing their favorite hobbies, which are called cozy activities in the game. The game is presented as a TV show, and at the start of each session, you narrate a short opening credits montage showing the women enjoying their cozy activities. Throughout the game, as a way of removing negative conditions, you'll have warm, intimate scenes between the characters, wherein they get emotionally vulnerable while enjoying their cozy activities together. The women are also members of the local Murder Mavens Mystery Book Club. They have a passion for mystery books, especially those featuring the globe-trotting super sleuth Amanda Delacour and have even acquired real-world detective skills from their extensive reading and discussion. By the time the story starts, the murder mavens have already helped the local authorities with several murder cases. Throughout the game, players will be presented with new mysteries to solve, and these investigations are the main focus of the story. The Gauntlet is raising funds to create two hardcover books. The first is Brindlewood Bay which includes the core rules for the game and six mysteries. The second is Nephews in Peril, a supplement that expands the game with new setting material and 10 new mysteries. Each book is going to be a hardcover, full color interior, A5 size, which is roughly six inches by nine inches, and approximately 150 pages. There is a short Kickstarter video, it's about, it's about two and a half minutes. It's going to tell you a whole lot more about 
this RPG. So let's kick back and give it a peek. A body washed up on the beach three days ago. It was Albert Krauss, a banker from Boston. The sheriff suspects foul play, but he hasn't been able to crack the case. Enter the Murder Mavens Mystery Book Club. When I joined the book club shortly after moving to Brindlewood Bay, I thought it was just for fun. Me and some of the local gals dissecting the latest Amanda Delacourt novel. I had no idea we'd be helping the sheriff solve real life murder cases. Brindlewood Bay is a tabletop role-playing game about a group of elderly women solving murder mysteries in a quaint New England town. They become aware of a dark occult conspiracy connecting the murders they're investigating and will have to face that dark conspiracy in order to save their community. The game is inspired by cozy murder mystery stories and supernatural fiction. It's Murder She Wrote meets H.P. Lovecraft. We're raising funds to create two hardcover books Brindlewood Bay and Nephews in Peril. Brindlewood Bay includes the core rules of the game and six mysteries. Nephews in Peril is a supplement for the game that includes expanded setting material and 10 more mysteries. I've been aboard the Krauss family's yacht for several hours now trying to get to the bottom of what happened to Albert. I've learned that his wife was having an affair. His son was recently cut out of the will and his daughter was an outrageous spender. Any one of them might have killed Albert and tossed his body overboard. I also found some rather interesting documents related to a land deal in Brindlewood Bay that went south. Something to follow up on for sure. Heck, even the old man that takes care of the Krauss family on their yacht seems suspicious. Could this be another case of the butler did it? And then there's that noise. I first heard it coming from deep inside the boat, from the engine room perhaps. A loud droning noise. The more I listen to the noise, I realize it's not a machine at all. It's something else. It's chanting. Strange words being chanted by a no doubt stranger group of people. This mystery has taken an unusual turn. I better see what the other murder mavens think. The Kickstarter project for Brindlewood Bay is past the 2,200% funding mark. Yes, you heard me correctly. 2,200%. You can reserve copies of the two books, which include the PDFs, for a $69 pledge, or you can grab just the PDFs for a $20 pledge through May 30th. And, of course, if you want just one of the books, you can do that as well. Expected delivery is this December. So I have to say that I do believe you can pick up Brindlewood Bay in PDF. And I don't think it was in the, I don't think it was the Gauntlet magazine that it was in. I think because like Trophy Gold, Trophy Gold was released for the most part through the Gauntlet magazine. And I don't think that was the case with Brindlewood Bay. But I know I had seen the PDF because I've shared a news piece about this when it originally came out. So Coco B is with us in chat asking, do these golden girls got guns? Probably. <laughs> Omnal is with us as well, mentioning that you can defeat cultists with baked goods. JPF is mentioning that they had backed that uh, Carnival Zombie uh, back in the day and says it was a long wait indeed. Yeah, as far as I understand, there were um, people upset that the publisher was not updating people on what was going on. So, hey, I guess there a lot of people are pleasantly surprised that they'll be getting that. So, there is that. So, there you have it, Pesty Trekkie. Brindlewood Bay, you wanted a mashup of Murder, She Wrote, and Call of Cthulhu. That is it. So let's talk about a money-saving deal because time is running out to take advantage of the hostile RPG bundle of holding. Here's the deets on the deal. Adventurer, name notwithstanding, this humble, 
Hostile Bundle is a friendly new offer of the tabletop science fiction role-playing game of deep space alien horror, Hostile, from Zozer Games. Based on the Cepheus engine rules, closely modeled on classic Traveler, Hostile is a gritty retro future setting inspired by movies like Outland, Blade Runner, and Alien. A universe of harsh planets and toxic atmospheres, claustrophobic space freighters, and brutal industrial colonies, ancient horrors entombed on icy moons, killer ETs, ouch, perfectly evolved to survive at any cost. Whether you're a combat-weary veteran or a miner on a grungy corporate star tug deep in the extraction zones, Hostile pits you against deadly hazards and unforgiving void where no one can hear you scream. Huh. That sounds familiar. What is that from? This all-new offer brings you much of the Hostile line for an unbeatable bargain price. An obviously generous and well-meaning gesture. For $9.95, you'll get all four titles in the starter collection with a retail value of $46 as DRM-free eBooks, including the complete standalone hostile rules and setting core books, the Gun Locker Weapons Guide, it'll come in handy, trust me, and the referee screen. And if you pay more than the threshold price of $23.19, You'll level up and also get the entire bonus collection with eight supplements worth an additional $56 that let you build out your pitiless universe. Three guides to survival on bad worlds that don't want you. Explorers, Dirt Side, and Colony Builder. Two bestiaries about entities that really, really do want you. Alien breeds and synthetics. It's also two hardware and vehicle guides, gunboats and shuttles, and Marine Corps Handbook 2215, as well as a complete campaign framework, well described by its title, Crew Expendable. These savings run through May 4th, and 10% of your payment after gateway fees will be donated to this hostile offers pandemic-related charity, Direct Relief. <laughs> I know nothing of this. I mean, I have heard of the Cepheus engine before, and I understand that it is based on classic Traveler, so the old GDW edition of the rules. And there's actually quite a lot out there for this from Zozer Games. So if you are looking for kind of an alien vibe or more of a, you know, like, gritty, dark, space operatic sort of uh, creation, this might be something you want to take a peek at. And of course, you'll save a bunch of money and actually help a charity as well. So 245 Trioxin has joined us in chat. Omenal points out that they find this intriguing because it's a new take. So, once again, Hostile. It's only around for a couple of more days on Bundle of Holding as well. Finally, there's a new adventure for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. It has arrived in PDF. Here's the details about The Emperor's Wrath from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. Steam tanks are mechanical wonders created by the genius Leonardo di Mirgelano in 2025 IC and mostly kept in working order by the Imperial College of Engineers in Altdorf. They are enormous war machines capable of propelling themselves over rough terrain and mounting large pieces of artillery. While the engineers are able to keep eight of the contraptions in working order, the secrets of their construction died with Leonardo. The remaining tanks are therefore highly prized. So when one of them goes missing on the road to Kerberg, Competent and discreet investigators are sought to track it down. The Emperor's Wrath is a complete adventure for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, but also includes a comprehensive guide to the history of the Empire's steam tanks, the weapons and equipment they carry, 
and how to pilot one of these steel behemoths in games. The scenario features a gripping mystery to discover what became of the steam tank Emperor's Wrath, a history of steam tanks, 12 wonders of engineering built centuries ago and maintained by the engineers of Altdorf, rules for operating a steam tank in Wifrip, and rules and background for the bog mummies, ancient whites who haunt the fens and mires of the old world. This 29-page PDF is available right now over at Drive Through RPG for four dollars and ninety-nine cents. Catching, always glad to see new Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay adventures arrive. So I am happy to see that. Seems a little bit different too. So it's uh, going to delve into steam tanks. Mm -hmm. And then out of nowhere, it's like bog mummies. It's like, okay, all right. So we get some bog mummies too. Sweet. All right. I was just talking right there about drive through RPG. Don't forget the gaming gang, thus the dispatch, is affiliated with the One Bookshelf site. So if you are going to visit drive through RPG, don't forget, swing on over to thegaminggang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a little portion of that sale. All those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up and help keep thegaminggang.com around. Also, if you like this video, if you dig the channel, if you feel thegaminggang.com is a valuable resource, if you like what we do, by all means, you can always buy me a cup of coffee or some soda by swinging on over to paypal.me slash thegaminggang and making a small donation. And I appreciate everybody out there who does pop over by paypal.me or uses the drive through sites, banners on thegaminggang.com. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Should point out, I guess drive through is going to start doing something where on Mondays they have D&D &D special. I don't know. It just popped up today. I just saw the new little banner ad that I'll be putting up. And I didn't really get into a whole lot of depth into it. But I believe it's every Monday there'll be discounts on D&D releases and we're talking stuff from the old tsr days stuff from dm's guild i guess so kind of interesting so yeah i'm still kind of stuffy here as sarah d pointed out here in illinois the weather has been crap you think it was march not may so like today it's like high 40s so we'll get it'll warm up a little bit for a day and then be crappy again so I guess for the rest of this week, it's supposed to be like in the 50s tops. So, yes, it's the, the crazy weather usually affects people, especially sinuses and things like that. Kevin says they picked up that bundle. So even though it and Mothership are stepping on each other's toes, they figured a lot of material might be stealable between the games. Yeah, because all Game masters worth their salt steal from systems all over the place. I did constantly. Always. Nothing wrong with borrowing some ideas from another system to use at your game table. Nothing wrong with it at all. Um, I was pointing out Mayflowers. Mm, yeah, we've had some rain. Not, not tons, but we, we had some rain. Usually we get the rain on the weekends. So it's even better. <laughs> All right. So that is it for the news tonight. So should mention on last Wednesday's show during the intermission, I shared what I felt was an extremely racist drive, drive in bumper. And I kept saying it was RC Cola and it wasn't RC Cola. It was Dr. Pepper. I honestly have no idea why I kept saying RC Cola, although there was another 
drive-in intermission bumper that I was looking to use that was from RC, and it was it was just bizarre. It wasn't racist. It was just bizarre. And I didn't use it because the music was actually flagged for a copyright. So if I had included it in the show, I'd get dinged for, you know, copyright infringement. So I didn't use it, but for some reason I had RC Cola on the brain. It was Dr. Pepper that created that evil, bizarre, let's be honest, non-politically correct, relatively racist ad that we saw on Wednesday that was actually really funny. So, Sarah points out a week or so ago, there was snow on Wednesday at 80 degrees on Saturday. Yes, I I recall that. And I mean, and the snow was coming down pretty good. So, all four seasons in one week is normal around these parts. I've said it before. I, I tell my friends this all the time. With the climate change, which, yes, does exist. Sorry for those of you who may be watching who don't believe it. I honestly think at some point, and not in the too far future, the Chicago area is going to have weather like Seattle. It's going to be more like Seattle. Uh, because I have noticed the past few years, the winters have not been as brutally cold as they were when I was growing up here, even not as cold as they were, say, 15 years ago. When I didn't live in Chicago, <laughs> I was out in Arizona. Don't have to worry about cold winters there, but yeah, I just it's just the impression I get that not as wet. I don't think it'll be as wet, but it'll be relatively moderate, but it's not going to get like, as warm as we sometimes have seen too. I get the feeling that this summer is going to be one of these summers that it's like, oh, it's 75 degrees as a high again. So. Overall says 2013, 2014, it got to negative 15. And Chicago people whined more about the cold. Well, I mean, I got to point out, if you live in the city, which I have in the past, it's only recently that I found myself out in the suburbs. Um, it's super windy. And if you're like on the street that happens to have a nice unblocked path to the lake, that wind just howls right through there. And it, I mean, it just cuts right into you. So I could see people in the city be kind of upset tell you what i certainly would not want to live in buffalo i have been through buffalo but i would not want to live there because uh i don't want to have to live someplace where if i go downtown i have to hang on to ropes as i walk along so so i don't get blown away all right so anyway today we are going to be taking a first look at crescent moon from Osprey Games. But first, it's time for a brief intermission. All aboard, the snack bar special for Coca-Cola, peanuts, hot dogs, ice cream, candy. That's the snack bar special for Coca-Cola, peanuts, hot dogs. Whatever your choice from the snack bar, things go better with Coke. Men, there's a drive-in movie full of juicy people. Wow! It, it's a trap! Oh, help! It's pick! We've had it, men. Oh. A pleasant aroma for you, but not for mosquitoes. Pick is easy to use. Light it and forget it. The exclusive aluminum-lined ashtray top means not an ash falls on the dash. Pick's aroma keeps mosquitoes, gnats, and sandflies away. 
Pick is the best protection for barbecues, fishing and camping trips, or just relaxing in the yard. No more sleepless nights or mosquito bites. Pick is harmless to children and pets, too. So if you don't want our company ever anywhere, and just like Pick him, see what I mean? Bye! Pick is on sale at the refreshment stand now. How about a refreshing ice-cold drink by itself or with a snack? Cold drinks in all your favorite flavors are ready and waiting for you at the refreshment center. Stop in. Get the frosty zing you get only from a refreshing ice-cold drink. And now, on with the show. Was that a wink from that guy? <laughs> like, what? Thought maybe he was, you know, having a stroke or something <laughs> for a minute. Board Game Grand has joined us. It's been a while since we've seen Board Game Grand. And they were not expecting an intermission. No, the intermissions are... Actually, they're not that new been a few months i think that i've been doing these intermissions yes it's usually some oddball drive driving movie bumper that i'll toss out there all righty so tonight i am unboxing and taking a first look at crescent moon from osprey games it's designed by stephen mathers with artwork provided by uh, navid Rahman. The game is for four or five players. So, kind of inter interesting here. It's for four or five. It's for ages 14 and up. Plays it in around 150 to 180 minutes. So, two and a half to three hours. It's going to carry an MSRP of $90 when it arrives on May 26th. So let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got Crescent Moon. All right, let's get the shrink wrap off of this. So, Board Game Grand says, White had COVID, then they got sick, and they're still sick. Thought they'd pop in and say howdy. Well, hello. Good to see you. Jason Bratley is with us. Good to see you, Jason. All right. So, let's take a look at the back here. I like the artwork on the cover. I find that pretty interesting. So, this is supposed to be a Middle Eastern-themed game. Read the back here. As the sun rises over the deserts, rivers, and oases of the caliphate, a delicate balance has been upset. As one of many rival powers in the region, you now have the opportunity to alter the course of history and seize power for yourself. The ambitious sultan sits in a golden palace presiding over great works of architecture. The secretive Murshid works to covertly undermine the central authorities through an expansive network of agents. The wandering tribes of the nomad aim to sow discord in order to secure employment for the experienced mercenary citizenry. The ravaging forces of the warlord sweep across the land, chasing after promises of plunder, and in the face of chaos and uncertainty, the caliph aims to preserve order through military might. Will you successfully navigate this web of rivalries and rise to prominence? Or will you squabble with your lesser adversaries and fade into obscurity? Crescent Moon is an area control game for four or five players. Take on the role of one of five radically asymmetric characters, each with their own objectives to fulfill, unique actions to utilize, and game-changing special powers to employ. Build symbiotic relationships with your allies, undermine your rivals, and choose your friends and enemies wisely in this cutthroat game of power and politics. All right. Let's jump on in. Do want to mention that the box has some heft to it. All right, come on. Why is this corner not lifting up? Ah, there we go. So we have our rule book. Let's 
little more to it than I was expecting. Let's see what we've got here. So we've got some historical notes. It says, Crescent Moon takes place amidst the dramatic rise and fall of powers across the Middle East in the 10th century and onward. Nice. Okay. So let's take a peek. See what we've got here. So we've got our components. So we've got markets. So we have a market board. We have a middle market, a near market, and we have the Sultan's market. Different coins. Phase tracker, victory point tokens, 16 terrain hexes, power cards, combat reference cards, and influence contest reference cards. So we've got the different pieces for each of the factions here. So, huh, okay, so these are getting six units. Six forts, three castles, 12 influence, one player booklet. I'm sure everybody gets a player booklet and one component bag. I'm sure everybody gets component bag. But you'll notice not only are their powers asymmetrical, it looks like their setup is going to be as well. So here we have the Rashid has six forts and three castles, where the Sultan has forts, castles, towns, cities. Not as much influence, though. The Caliph has more units. So, overview. Crescent Moon is an asymmetric area control game for four or five players. Well, we knew that. In the game, players take actions to affect a shared map, which is made up of terrain hexes. Each player will try to achieve different things on this map. Most players will be aiming to gain military control of certain hexes, by having pieces with combat strength in the hex, or gain political control of hexes by ha having an influence token in the hex. Game is divided into years. During a year, each player takes four actions. At the end of a year, players score points according to their character's unique objectives. Each character comes with a player booklet that lists their objectives and available actions. At the end of the game, the player with the most points is the winner. So we get some terminology talking about the setup here. So I would think that our game board, our map, is going to be different every time. I would think. So here we've got the terrain. Fertile, wilderness, mountain, quarry, and desert. They feature holy sites, rivers, river crossings. Talking about adjacency. I have the impression that this would probably appeal to uh, a good number of war gamers out there, even though there's a lot of abstraction and things like that. This is a historical sort of game, and it is going to focus, it appears to be uh, quite a bit on combat and influence. So here's the action phase. So we have a specific order that the actions will be resolved. The Warlord, Rashid, Sultan, Caliph, and Nomad. So we've got influence, building. So you can build strongholds, forts, or castles, or settlements, towns, and cities. And it's showing who has these actions, I guess, available to them. So you can move units. You can assault from one hex to an adjacent hex where another player has control. You can recruit. So you can recruit units. You can bribe mercenaries in a five-player game. You can hire mercenaries in the four-player game. So I guess there's a little bit of difference between the four- and five-player game when you're going to be recruiting and hiring your mercenaries. You can buy power cards as well. So it looks like you can never have more than eight cards in your hand. So we've got some unique actions as well. So Uprising in Mass is the Warlord. We've got Plot, Conspire, Move Palace, and Desert. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe that's Desert because it says you're removing mercenary units. So I guess the mercenary units are going to Desert. 
Then we have a scoring phase. And then we have the game end. When players have completed the agreed upon number of years, three in the standard game and four in the long game, the game ends. All players reveal their victory points. And the player with the most points, winner, winner, chicken dinner. So we have some additional rules for combat. We've got an example combat. Influence contest. We've got unique attributes as well. And we've got some map setups. Okay. So divided land, fresh meltwater, the fertile valley, open plains. So it's showing a setup for four and five players. And the meeting points. Variable setup rules. And talking about starting pieces. And a quick reference chart on the back. So far, this looks pretty interesting. Here are, we've got the booklets. They're only papers. I'm going to tell you right now, I would have probably rather seen these be cardstock like we would see say in a GMT game because they would just hold up so much better uh, this is just paper of course it it's treated but it's you know it's still just paper so here's the warlord with their actions Kind of a bit of flavor text, it looks like, about the Warlord, telling you more about that character. Their unique attributes, their objectives, and how they score victory points. And then it looks like their income and the pieces they have available to them. So once again, we got the Warlord, we've got the Caliph, the Marshid, the Sultan, and the Nomad. Sweet. And they all are different. And each one of these is going to have a different approach to winning the game. No doubt. All right. Let's see what we've got with some of the punch boards here. All right. So we, these were the influence markers, I believe, is what we saw before. We've got our coins. So we've got gold and we've got silver. These are victory point tokens, which are actually the shape of crescent moons. <laughs> so there you have that. Going right along with the game there, with the game title. Oh, so we've got our market as well. So I think, once again, all of a sudden, my nose is starting to run again. Boy, I tell you, it's weird. It's weird down here. I think with these markets, sections we actually take the power cards and i think we'll have the power cards available in the market because it looks like it's got like a little cutout where you would lay the cards so that was the far market we got the middle market more coins more victory point tokens more influence tokens as well we got the near markets of course these are all dual sided Ah, so I'm going to take a stab in the dark that the players are able to take their victory point tokens and have them face down so that nobody knows exactly how many victory points any player happens to have at any one time. I would not be shocked. Then we have the Sultan's Market. We've got our year tracker over here. We've got our phase tracker as well. So we've got four punch boards. Then we've got a bunch of tokens. Here are the draw bags. Oh, those, that's kind of cool. We've got the symbol for each of the factions. So we've got a bunch of baggies there. So here are our tiles. Here's our deck of, I think these are all the same, well, not all the same, it's all the same deck. I think these are the power cards.
that's kind of cool that they each have oh nice nice material too these will hold up so each of these has the icon for each of the factions. So Board Game Grant mentions, yeah, the bags are nice. Yeah, these are actually very nice. Here we go. So we've got all of those. And then we've got a bunch of different wooden tokens. So we're going to have castles. We're going to have cities. We've got our units. So I believe, I think these are our mercenaries for the different factions. And I'm taking a guess these are going to be wood. I don't think they're plastic. If I could actually get the bag open, we'll find out. <laughs> Jeez, come on. Oh, and I thought I had it for a sec. Oh, I just can't barely get. There we go. For crying out loud. And they are wood. So Coco B says, no need for Crown Royal bags for this game. No, I use the Crown Royal bag for my dice. I have a Crown Royal bag that is probably, no kidding, 34. Five. Yeah, about 35 years old. That's what I use as my dice bag. So, and I know I'm not alone. There are lots of people who do that. Right, so we also have our castles. We've got our towns and cities. So these are, I think these are towns and cities. It's like so. Kind of interesting that this is a different color, yellow. I wonder. Let's take a look at the. I think only one faction gets these. I think. There you go. Thanks. Thanks for finally uh, focusing there, Sony. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> and then we've got castles. Maybe these are the merc these must be the mercenaries, the black. And then these are the units for each of the factions. All right, now we got the castles. These castles are actually pretty big. Pretty chunky. Just like so. Cool. And I think these are stickers on here, but the stickers are actually nice and flush. So nothing is actually, you know, kind of like sticking off of it at all. So Board Game Grant points out they've got some RPG dice that age as well. I have to chuckle because my best friend, Elliot Miller, who I talk about quite often on the show, he has his original D basic D and D box dice. Those awful dice that looked like they were made like out of wax. <laughs> he's still got them. I think he's actually got one of the crayons too. So I don't my dice. I don't have dice that old. Um, I think I think the oldest die I probably have is about fifteen years old. No, maybe, maybe about 20. All right, so we've got these power dice, and then we've got our tiles here. Let's take, let, let's take a look at the tiles. So I think that's a holy site. And that's a desert. That is a river crossing. Their work on this is nice. It's very cool. Very cool. Same same art style as the cover. So there's there's a river, and another river. So this is this must be like fertile land. And they are 
only single sided. We got some mountains. Not sure what that's supposed to be. Quarry, maybe, because it looks like it's rock outcroppings. Let's see. So these are our terrain tiles, and as you can see, they're they're pretty good size. This is what we're gonna create our our map with. All right, and we'll take a peek. At these cards here. Kevin says the weirdest moment he had realizing the first RPG dice he owned were older than some of the people he was gaming with. It's not just a meme. Yeah, well, I have to point out, Elliot's uh, dice are older than our friendship, and we've been best friends for 40 years. 41, I think it is now. All right. So it looks like, yes, these are all the same deck. So we've got Warfare, Assassinate. Cool artwork on these two. So we'll have multiple cards. Holy cow. There was a lot of those. Intimidate. Compel. So I'm kind of curious, are these going to be the cards only available to that faction? Or does that faction maybe get a bonus if they, they utilize this card? I'm curious. So we have Muster. Seize. Betray. Ships. Is it rebel or rebel? I'm going to take a guess. It's rebel. And then incite. Corrupt. And that is all of those. So we have general, guards, cavalry, infantry, ships, siege engines, Iman, camelry, warriors, elder. Veterans, these are, the, these are the nomads. I also noticed that each faction, uh, they have different numbers of cards as well. So we've got the Ravager, Raiders, this is the Warlord, Marauder. Got some reference cards, so should have five of those, right? Those are a combat reference. And then we've got our influence contest reference cards here as well. So we have five of each of those. And then we have reserve cards. So we have the Nomad. I believe this is the Caliph. The Caliph. And that's the Warlord. I am not sure why we only have three of the five. All right. So Jason points out that uh, one of his player's daughters occasionally joins the, his game, and she's only five years older than 5th edition is. That's, that's kind of funny. All right. So I think this deck will fit in one of these. It will not, so I'll just split it in half. So the cards don't go flying all over the box. I gotta say, this looks very unique. 
And I like the fact that each of the factions has uh, their own unique uh, abilities and actions that they can take. It looks like they have unique cards that they'll they'll play as well. And uh, I like that. Very cool. All right, so we've got the really nice bags, as well as the, I think they were 16 of them, 16 tiles. We've got the various different castles, fortifications. We've got the cities and towns. I believe those are, once again, the mercenaries and the other units. We have four punch boards. We've got our five player booklets for each of the factions. And we've got our rules book. And that's what we find when we take everything from Crescent Moon outside the box. Very nice production quality on this as well, I can tell you. Very well put together. Looks like uh, these components are going to you know, be able to uh, last a lot of gameplay as well. Spend a lot of time on your table. Jason points out that he loves asymmetrical games. So do I. And this is kind of striking me, not to kind of go off topic here, but to me, this almost looks like this could be a nice uh, replacement for say, like a coin series game from GMT, because the coin series games tend to be relatively complex for the most part. Not Kuba Libra is pretty easy to jump into, but some like Pendragon and things like that, they are fairly complex. And one of the big, you know, selling points of those is the asymmetrical factions. So I am very curious to take a look at how these asymmetrical factions operate in Crescent Moon as well. Once again, this game is for four or five players, ages 14 and up, plays in around 150 to 180 minutes. It's going to carry an MSRP of $90 when it arrives in stores on May 26th. And I will do my best to have a review of Crescent Moon in the relatively near future. We have uh, some weekends of gaming coming up, amazingly enough. So I am looking forward to that. And uh, stay tuned. So very nice. And of course, do want to point out the fine folks over at Osprey Games did provide me with this review copy. But of course, as I always tell you, neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share my First look at Crescent Moon. These days, it's important that you know that. All right, so what's cooking this week? So on tomorrow's show, we are going to take a first look and page through Death in Space. Or as I like to say it, Death in Space. From Free League Publishing. So we were talking earlier about hostile RPG and <laughs> mothership. Well, now we've got death in space. And this is kind of like the hologram color, uh, color, cover, color. So I thought that was kind of cool. So we are going to take a look at this tomorrow. On Wednesday show. We are going to take a look at Monsters of the Wilderness, Oswald's Curse. This is from Kwood Publishing. And you may have seen some of my reviews of the other bestiaries that have come out from Kwood. They're, they're really fun. They're, they're pretty cool. They're very interesting uh, monster books. And, of course, I would expect this to be no exception. Also should point out, next week, all week long, it is Ruins of Symborum Week. That's right. I have received the core books for Ruins of Symborum from Free League Publishing. This, of course, is for 5e. So, all next week, 
We're going to be taking a look at these. So I've got the player's guide, the game master's guide, and the bestiary, as well as the game master screen, which I think has an adventure. I think there's an adventure in here as well. I know a lot of people are excited about this. A lot of people back this on Kickstarter and they want to check it out. I am curious about it as well. One of the things I'm curious about is uh, how much of the artwork is going to be just the same artwork that we've seen in Symborum and how much of it is going to be new. So I'm kind of curious. I think Symborum is a cool setting. I, I really do think it is a very, very cool setting. Mechanically, it's all right. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's it's typical of Free League Publishing's uh, your zero engine. So, but for 5e, I think a lot of people are going to be very intrigued by Ruins of Symborum. So we are going to be taking a look at that all of next week. And of course, I've got other things on the horizon as well. And stay tuned. I will have plenty of standalone videos as well. So if you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do, did I say subscribe? I'm just zoning out all of a sudden. There's a bug flying around. It's like, I hate when there's a bug down here in the duct tape studios because it always like catches my eye as it flies around the lighting. It's like, go away. Anyway. If you do subscribe to the channel, be sure to ring that bell because it'll not only let you know when the Dispatch streams live Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central, but also let you know when I upload other videos such as my review of Pathfinder Punks in a Powder Keg, the first chapter of the Outlaws of Elkenstar uh, Adventure Path from Paizo Inc., you might be surprised by my review. Check it out. All right. That is it for this time out. If you were watching live, thank you very much. Always appreciate it. Of course, if you took part in chat, hey, right there, those are extra bonus experience points. I'm telling you, you're, you're almost at level three, most of you. Most of you, not all of you. Some of you don't show up enough to get enough experience, but. Others are very close to level three. But of course, I also know there are a lot of people out there. They don't have an opportunity to watch live. Doesn't matter how you watch. Could be live, could be on Memorex. It's important to me is you actually take some time out and check out the videos. And I really do appreciate all of you doing that. I should also point out, we have crossed the 7,000 subscriber threshold. Thought that was kind of cool. I mean, that's on the heels of the over 1 million views on the channel. So I thought that was kind of cool as well. All right. I will be back tomorrow. Once again, we're going to be taking a look at Death in Space from Free League Publishing. And of course, I always hope each and every one of you out there gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. See you later. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel by clicking right here. Check out the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch or find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks for watching.